silent treatment, stonewalling. The narcissist uses this as a power play, all right? It's used to um, punish, to control, to incite pain, elicit pain, whatever. Um, it is a controlling power play used to avoid any topic they don't want to talk about, to avoid any accountability for anything that they have done or that you are potentially, possibly even considering, perceiving, maybe even wanting to talk to them about something they have done. So they do this to avoid anything that they, any real issue that they need to talk about. They do it to play the victim and provoke your apologies. They do this to get you beneath them so that you're groveling and begging for forgiveness in order to put them back up on the pedestal they think they belong on and in the, in the place of superiority within the relationship. So, um, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a really ugly, uh, a tactic for taking control from someone else. It, um, Silent treatment is not walking away. So let's talk about what it's not. Somebody who is upset, somebody who's overwhelmed, who's angry, who's uh, emotionally having a reaction to something that needs to step away and take a break for a minute, that needs to compose themselves, that needs to go take a few breaths, that needs to step outside and compose themselves check their thoughts before they speak, before they say something that they re would regret saying, before they lash out in anger. Somebody that needs to basically just take a break, take, take a few minutes, chill out, whatever you want to call it. That is not the silent treatment. Okay, so we go, we, we can't, we have to give some room for people. I'm not talking about, well, we'll talk about what the silent treatment is and you'll see the difference here. We have to give some room for one another to have our coping mechanisms in place that keep us from lashing out at other people. So a lot of us really need to step back when we're being, when we feel attacked and we feel threatened when we feel like we're or when we've actually done something wrong and we need to think about how we're going to respond to something without responding in our reaction to our own guilt and shame and reaction we have to ourselves for what we've done. Right? So that is not the silent treatment being quiet for a few minutes, a few seconds, 10 second pause. I mean, we tell children, we tell each other, we tell adults with anger management, take 10 seconds, breathe before you respond. That isn't the silent treatment. What is the silent treatment? Is a frequently occurring silence in the place of discussion, in the place of any um, real reaction or discussion to something. It's done abruptly, usually within it's talking like this, and I'm telling you something, and I'm And you may get, I can't do the stare, but you may get the stare, right? And that's it, right? And it's not, okay, give me a minute and stepping away, okay? Got to give that space there. And we have to understand that because uh, it's really easy, especially after abuse, to think everyone is giving us a silent treatment when they need a break or when they need to take a breath or something. So um, it's done to suppress your thoughts and any resolution, correct? Thank you, James. It is. It is a. Um, it's a form of punishment. You feel it as punishment, as the receiver of the silent treatment. You feel it as, like you feel like you're being punished, almost like you're a child being punished often. And it's confusing. It's, yeah. So um, it keeps their opponent. Yeah, you get that as an opponent, as in you're not a partner. You're an opponent at the. When a narcissist feels threatened, attacked, when their ego is being questioned, when their mask is being questioned, when their actions are being questioned, or they're being asked to take any accountability, they instantly see you as the opponent. You are no longer a partner trying to work through a situation. You are an opponent because it's, it's either you believe in their mask or you don't. <laughs> and that's it. There's no, there's no, there's nothing else. And so once you become the opponent, it's used to, um, it's used to weaken you. It's used to empower the narcissist and, you know, create control over you as the opponent. So it's used to make you the weaker opponent in the situation. And 
Um, so another thing that would that makes it silent treatment is it only ends generally, generally, it ends only with an extraordinary amount of time. Some of them go weeks or for, and then for no reason, right? And it won't be talked about. The issue won't be discussed. The silence won't be discussed. All right. It's it's ends or you plead, you beg, you apologize. You apologize for, I just have to apologize for stuff I didn't do in order to just make it go away, make the silence stop. Um, you don't get an apology for the silent I mean, if you do, it's words like, I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry you felt hurt by that. Or I'm sorry that that, you know, it's covert apologies, the passive aggressive um, sort of, I mean, this is a passive aggressive tactic. The silent treatment is aggression. Okay. It's an aggressive behavior, but it's passive aggressive. Uh -huh. Okay. So extended silence. That's another example of the silent treatment. Stepping away for five minutes, coming back and discussing is not the silent treatment. Stepping away for five minutes and then another five minutes and then never coming back. Stepping back in the room like nothing happened. That's silent treatment. That's the cold shoulder and the brush off. Stonewalling. All right. Okay, let me see what you guys are saying. My aunt is a master at the silent treatment. Uh-huh. It really messes you up. It gave me terrible anxiety. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about that, about how it affects us. Um, I tend to do the silent treatment. I'm afraid that might be fleas from my parents. How childish of me. You know what? It can be learned. It's not just narcissists who give the silent treatment. So don't go diagnosing anyone or yourself if you are a person who goes completely silent when you're angry. It is something to work on because it does affect other people and it isn't really resolving the problem, right? You can see that in yourself. You can, I think all of us probably have some, some form of um, avoidance when we're upset and hurt. And then and those are what we work on, right? Within ourselves. So seeing it in yourself does not make you a toxic person. Does it make this to this behavior healthy of you? Probably not, but it's, you know, um, now, the difference is if you're going silent with toxic people, that is the, a different situation. If you're going silent with everyone because it's a learned behavior, then it is something, you know, maybe you want to look at in yourself. I don't know if that, if you feel that that would be um, beneficial to having more healthy relationships. If you're trying to have a healthy relationship with toxic people, you can't. If you're, silent, if you're being silent and you're a survivor of narcissistic abuse and you're still dealing with even minimally toxic people or toxic behavior from non-toxic people and you go silent over that, that's a different situation. So I would, if it were me, I'd look at why I go silent and when and what is it triggering in me and why, why am I doing it? Um, when a narcissist does it, it is a power play. They know they're doing it. They have to know they're doing it. You can't do that more than once and not know you're doing it. You know, you know, you know, even when it's not like there's excuses you can make for yourself. Like, well, that's just what I do. I just, I just, he used to say, I, I don't have anything to say. And I'm like for that many days, really? I don't think so. What it means is I don't want to process these emotions. I don't want to process the fact that I have to be accountable for something. And there's a difference between um, if you feel like you're in trouble and you're going silent because you don't know what to say and using the silence to avoid being accountable for anything, right? So again, it depends on why <laughs> and for yourself for as a survivor. As a toxic person, the reason that they're doing it is completely different. Totally disappearing, ghosting you for however long they feel like it. Yes, um, Darla says he never gave me the silent treatment until I questioned his behavior. Uh-huh, because then there's accountability to be had and there's questioning of the of the the mask, really. Silent treatment looks like them not responding to you suddenly when they change plans but didn't tell you and then expect you to accept it gracefully without question. You're to accept everything gracefully without question. Absolutely. Um, is the stonewalling also considered gaslighting? Yes. Yeah. It's all part of, of the under the same umbrella of of the toxic behaviors that are associated with gaslighting. Okay, um, I think mine did it so he wouldn't have to take accountability for his behavior or enough time would pass and I would let it go. Exactly why they do it. It's exactly why they do it, but you see how that's power? It wields power over having to never 
be responsible, right? <clears throat> okay. How do you deal with something this unhealthy in a healthy way? You deal with it by, there isn't really, I don't think, a healthy way to live with silent treatment. I think what there is is self-protected ways to um, not engage in the silent treatment. And let me explain what goes on first so that you know, so you can maybe for yourself come up with ideas for your own self-care here. So what's going on? So we know what it is. We talked about that. Um, may refusal to speak, not acknowledging what someone says, pretending not to hear what they say. Um, it could be even, I'm trying to say, um, getting distracted while someone's speaking and, and going over here and not, you know, ignoring, not paying attention, distancing yourself, themselves from being around you. The ignoring of the expected needs of another person, the express needs, I'm sorry. Someone expresses their needs and you blatantly ignore them. That's a form of silent treatment. It's a form of silence. It's a form of avoidance, right? Invalidating behavior that makes somebody else feel invisible. Okay. Those are ways the silent treatment manifests. So, okay, so what happens is in your brain, so this is why silent treatment is abuse, okay? Because silent treatment to someone is received in the pain center of the brain. It's a place called the anterior cingulate cortex. Cingulate, that's right. Anterior cingulate cortex is a zone of the brain, okay? And I don't know exactly where it is in the brain, but that's its name. <laughs> and it is responsible for the detecting of pain levels. So they have, scientists have proven that that part of the brain lights up in an MRI studies when the silent treatment is being given to someone, when someone is feeling the, the, the impact of silent treatment, it, um, it activates that part of the brain. What happens then is the same thing that activates, same thing that happens when any pain is felt, any pain is being detected in the body. There are physical symptoms that begin to align with the pain center firing in your brain. So the brain telling you you're having pain, even though it's not physical pain, it is registered where physical pain is registered. Not all things are, this is, this is a big one. It is literal abuse. It creates um, physical symptoms like, well, headaches, digestive issues, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue. Um, it can go as far as raised blood pressure and autoimmune issues is what they have um, linked to it. So prolonged silent treatment. Now, doing it once in a while, like someone was saying, you know, I do that. That is, we're talking about prolonged silence that you're that, that they are, are doing within a within a relationship that has a span of time. It's not, oh, I got the silent treatment today. Now I'm going to have all these issues. Or oh my gosh, I didn't talk to my friend when I was mad at her. I just gave her all these issues. If you're coming back and resolving this, and you're and you're dealing with it, and it's not a prolonged exposure, this is within a relationship. We're talking about abusive, emotionally abusive relationships. We're talking about over a span of time, right? And it's not just a one time occurrence. So because this is happening over and over and over and your cortisol levels are rising and we, I've talked about what that does in the brain as well, it swells the amygdala and it creates the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response to be activated and always active. So if you have that completely activated all the time, couple it with all this other stuff because your pain center is being triggered. And there's my little geek out for the day about what happens in the brain, but it's important to remember that because so what can you do? Why does it hurt so much? Why is it, why is it's triggering? It's hurting more because you're responding to it. It's hurting more and more because we're having a reaction to it. How we're sensing it in our emotions is we're feeling what? Rejected. We're feeling excluded. We're feeling our lower, our self-esteem is being lowered. It is, um, we are feeling invisible, unheard, uh, ostracized, like we don't matter. It lowers your worth and your the way you feel about yourself. That's how we're feeling it. But it's also all this other stuff going on in the brain is like pain, pain, pain. This hurts. This hurts. So if we're reacting to this by um, trying to, what do we try to do? We try to make it stop, right? We try to, we go into it. We have to gray rock this. There's no, I don't know of another way <clears throat> to manage it except gray rocking it personally. 
because otherwise you're engaging with it. If you're engaging with gaslighting, you're going to be more stressed out at the end than if you just didn't engage with it. It's still going to hurt. It's still, it's still not fun. You can't make healthy out of unhealthy. You can't take poison, throw it in the soup and call it soup that's healthy for you, right? Oh, it's poison soup. It will always be poison because it's a toxic relationship. However, to lower the effect that it has on you when you're stuck in it and you can't get out yet or you are around family and this is what they do and you've got to deal with it and you can't get away from it, then not engaging with it quite so emotionally, quite so invested. Who cares if the narcissist is quiet? I know you're lonely and stuff, but you're going to be more lonely with their devaluing nonsense coming at your way. That makes it worse. Anything out their mouth is toxic. So anything that's not coming out their mouth, learn to see that as a vacation from the toxic spewing that comes out of their mouth. Because even their positive is toxic because it's the bait right back in. It's the lure to catch you and pull you right back into their, into the trauma bonds, right? You guys take care. If you need anything related to narcissistic abuse recovery, head over to queenbeing.com. Lots of info over there. And if you need coaching, and there is group coaching continuously going on, which is comes to 15 a week. So that is the lowest cost option. And it is ongoing. So you can start whenever. Everything's in the main description of every video. So check it out.